Hi, everybody. It is 4.30 here in London, um, and it is time for us to get kicked off. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know everybody is busy, so I appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to join us. Um, so we are here for the Incubate Ignite um, event called Marketplaces Where Opportunity Awaits. And we are joined today by our partner, Feedonomics. Um, before I pass you over, just a couple housekeeping rules. Um, we're going to be running about 50 minutes today. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat function on the side and we will answer them at the end. We are also going to be doing polls throughout. Um, so there's a polls tab on the side so you can find those there and you will be able to answer them. We are also recording today's session. So for any reason you can't stay for the full 50 minutes or you love it so much you wanna share it with everybody at your business, which we highly recommend, um, it will be avail available to you after today. I am joined today by Jason Chow, who is the Enterprise Account Director at Feedonomics. He has three cats and one dog, a fan of esoteric collecting and building computers. You'll have to ask him what that is about. Um, and then I'm also joined by Fred Maud, our Head of Product Development at Incubita. Um, I'm not entirely sure he knew I was going to read out these bullet points because um, he is a juggling performer and a rock collector. Um, Fred, you will have to let us know if those are true. Um, and now today we will be covering what marketplaces are, why they are important, and how and when to consider marketplaces and the impact of selling through marketplaces. Um, now I believe it is time for me to hand over to Fred. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh... Unfortunately, the, the juggling thing is true. We're not going to do it in today's session, but uh, maybe one for the future. Um, to, to kick things off, uh, what would be really good to understand uh, as, a, as a starting point from people, and feel free to use the chat throughout the talk at any time you need to, but please submit any challenges that you're currently facing or have faced when uh, launching marketplaces. Um, can think really anything here in terms of integration uh, all the way up to maybe performance as well at the other end so anything you have uh, in terms of marketplace challenges please share them with us within the chat so to kick things off today uh, what we want to go over is first of all what what are marketplaces and um, so i'm going to take take you through a number of different marketplaces uh, and kind of uh, their, their usps start though uh, what I want to ask really quickly and there's a poll uh, you will find uh, the poll in the top right uh, third tab along uh, inside there's a poll up there now at the moment and this is for us to get a bit of an understanding of uh, people's knowledge base of, of marketplaces currently so they go all the way from I don't have a clue uh, to I've heard of them before um, to I'm about to launch on a marketplace I'm already on a marketplace if, what other ones should I be using? Or you're a complete expert um, and, and you should be running running this course instead of myself and Jason. So I'll just give you just give you another 10 or 15 seconds to answer that. I can see quite a few few answers are coming in already. So thank you. Thank you for answering. Cool. So it seems like we've got we've got a nice, nice range of uh, different capabilities with marketplaces. Um, no, no experts, uh, which I suppose is is good for us it means that we can we can go through and, and take you through some more detail cool so uh, in terms of uh, marketplaces um obviously that there, there, there's some some very obvious ones out there um and you'll you'll recognize the logo some of the logos on this page almost immediately um please feel free uh, again to use the chat to just chuck in any other marketplaces that you think um, are important to you or, or, or ones that you want you're interested in exploring because we can always come back to you if, if it's not something we're going over today so first of all uh, to kick things off amazon of course largest online marketplace in the world um roughly about 118 billion in in revenue in 2018 and obviously it's growing growing year on year about a third of all all journeys within the u.s start of user journeys in the US start on Amazon. Uh, so obviously if you're, if you're not there, then you are missing out on, on a 
large portion of, of potential customer base. Obviously, they're global. Um, they're great for manufacturers or niche brands. Um, if you're niche, obviously, the, the competition is decreased uh, quite dramatically. Um, and the commission will range by category, but averages between about 10 uh, and 15%. Um, for, for other retailers, I mean, there's KitchenAid up on here. Um, this will be a really highly competitive space to compete on, on KitchenAid products with because there's many, many resellers. So this is likely to, to, to be tough tough space for any any retailers. Um, one of the big benefits of um, of Amazon is that they, they've got an exemplary user experience and service, and this is due to, to massive amounts of work that they've done on their platform. Um, Instagram checkout uh, is being spoken about a lot at the moment. Um, it allows you to, to connect directly uh, to, to your brand. This is based in the US um, at the moment, but it's due to come out globally later on this year. Um, you need to have shopping already enabled um, and, and then you'll get approved. Um, you need to add in uh, additional information, name, email, shipping address, uh, and provide this uh, to the merchant. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the other things, if you don't already have them in, in your product feed, you'll need to include size, color, inventory, quantity, Google product category, and this is required for tax reasons. And at the moment, as it's based in the US, you will also need a US tax ID, US bank account, and can ship to, to US addresses as well. Benefit of this lowest commission rate uh, out of all of the marketplaces we're going to cover is about 5%. Um, and also, you get that increase uh, effect, uh, increase reach uh, that you gain from, from the fact that the influencers are live there on the platform as well. Um, so Facebook Marketplace as well, um, very similar in terms of it, its functionality to Instagram. Um, at the moment, it is, it is quite dated, uh, but it's expected that it is going to be faceless fairly, fairly soon. Um, it's going to give you additional reach. Um, there are actually limited businesses selling on Facebook at the moment. So early adopter advantage is something that is very, very, very real. Um, Everyone's well aware of how many people use Facebook, so obviously that's a big advantage. Um, you can you can grab people when when they're going about their day to day, -to -day lives on Facebook, and then the added massive thing that Facebook have is all this demographic targeting and data um, that will that will really supercharge uh, your marketplace campaign. So on to a couple of ones in the US. Target, um, obviously massive, massive retailer in the US, huge amounts of digital sales, 5 billion plus, um, and, and growing year on year massively. Huge loyal customer base. Um, so there's a lot of people you can target here. Um, and also an elevated uh, guest services, uh, first mover advantage as it is, is relatively uh, infant in terms of its development. Um, and other things here are they do a fully managed onboarding service um, and also the benefit of having uh, stores as well as uh, having being online is you also get in-store returns as well. The, the, the difficulty in this one is it does require pre-approval or invita invitation in order to get on. Further sticking in the US, uh, you've got Walmart. Um, obviously everyone knows Walmart, second largest on online retailer. Uh, 13 to 15 billion in revenue annually. Now that it's huge, obviously, but still only about 10% of what Amazon are achieving at the time. Um, growing massively, especially in Canada, uh, and again, got a very uh, nice mix of uh, customers. Uh, trusted, trusted brand experience, obviously, many people trust trust Walmart, uh, and same same thing with a dedicated account manager. Should you should you want to go live with Walmart? eBay, um, a bit of a resurgence as of late. Um, I think it was the forgotten about marketplace for, for a very long time, but a huge number of active buyers globally. 35% um, of all US mobiles do have uh, the eBay app, which is a huge number. Uh, and it's certainly something that, that just by listing here, you can take advantage of. Um, if you're in the electronics and accessories uh, space, um, this, is, this is a really good opportunity and eBay is something that we'd, we'd certainly recommend. Um, and also you get uh, good coverage on PPC campaigns as well. And you can also run your own uh, through uh, the eBay partner network. 80% uh, of goods sold are new now, and that's where I'm in 
there's a bit of a resurgence as of late. People, I think, still associate eBay a lot of the time um, with uh, used goods, but that is not the case. Um, it's the third most preferred marketplace by US sellers. They have an affiliate program, and also you've got the option to do it via auction. So on to a relatively new one. Um, obviously, with, with me saying earlier that, that about 30 percent of journeys in the US start on Amazon. Google are uh, not happy necessarily about this and they're looking to, to create their own marketplace experience as well. Uh, obviously people trust Google um, and that means that this could be a very successful product as going forward, currently only available in the US. Um, you get personalized recommendations, um, it's compatible with Google Assistant as well, so extra reach there uh, and will be coming to YouTube as well. It's best used in combination with Google Shopping. So if you're not uh, currently doing Google Shopping, I would say that this was this would be the first step. Um, but this will then give you increased visibility as well. Uh, on buy uh, worldwide, uh, recently launched in 2016, um, recently uh, funded as well. They're going through global expansion, and they are actually the world's fastest growing marketplace uh, and one of the fastest growing companies in the UK. The ease of integration uh, with, with this marketplace is, is really, really high. So if you are struggling uh, to integrate with a the marketplace, then this is, this is one I would highly recommend uh, to look at. They also don't uh, actually sell any of their own products, so you won't be competing uh, with the marketplace themselves uh, for listing. And finally, I mean, to be honest, most of the things I'm talking through today and Jason will be talking through are, are B2C, but don't forget that there are B2B, many B2B platforms out there. One of them uh, that, that's really great is, is Shelf Now. Uh, it's a B2B platform that actually enables uh, brands or, or, or locally sourced food uh, to be actually served out to restaurants and, and shops uh, around the EU. And this is all done uh, in the same way, the same sort of agreement that you would get from, from an Amazon marketplace. Um, and it's a pretty cool AI-driven recommendation engine powering search discovery on both sides of, of the marketplace. So there's a, almost a double marketplace in this one. And then I'm going to pass over to Jason to, to take you through uh, why all of what I've just spoken through is important. All right. Thanks, Fred. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, uh, it's Jason. I'm on the Feedonomics and our Enterprise Account Director. I'm based here in San Francisco. Um, also, really appreciate you all making the time today. Um, the esoteric collecting, if anyone was wondering, is comic books, comic art. Uh, never quite outgrew it. What are you going to do? So um, I'm going to talk about marketplaces, kind of why they're important, and share some best practices. Um, I think mainly specifically around Amazon. But I think before we get into that, um, we've got another poll. So uh, in the kind of top right of the screen, we've got a couple questions, really, why are marketplaces important, kind of what you're hoping to achieve. And of course, you can pick as many as are relevant to you. Um, you know, are you looking to drive more sales, keeping up with the Kardashians? I hear they're very popular. Uh, extend customer reach, uh, provide a better experience to your customers than on your website, uh, or really just reach your customers and your target audience where they are. So if you could take a couple minutes to submit a vote. All right. OK, not super surprising. Drive more sales is the big one. Um, definitely get your products out in many, as many places, as many different channels to as many people as possible. So it makes complete sense. Um, I think the poll will stay open. So feel free to continue to submit responses um, if you like. I think the first thing that we're going to do to kind of start uh, is just kind of talk about some broad statistics. Um, uh, why do marketplaces matter? And you know, as Fred said, Amazon, of course, everybody's familiar. They're global. They're massive. I feel like every day I'm opening my news app and I'm seeing uh, another article about how Jeff Bezos is getting richer. <laughs> um, and this is pretty much why, right? So if you take a look really at some of these numbers, they're very st completely staggering numbers. Um, you know, 55% of all product searches originate on Amazon. This is across the internet, right? So an incredible, incredible market share there. Uh, and of those 55%, that start on Amazon, 92% of them 
you know, actually end up purchasing on Amazon, right? Obviously, they've created this ecosystem, this workflow, and this process that has made it just way, way too easy for us to buy stuff that sometimes we need and sometimes we don't. Um, and, you know, on really any platform, but Amazon and Walmart specifically, about 80% of sales that are, you know, happening on the platforms at all are happening through the buy box. And so the buy box, which we'll talk about a little bit later, of course, um, everybody I think has encountered this as a consumer is really that first kind of highlighted seller, um, you know, on Amazon specifically, it's just the one that is the default when you check out, um, there's options potentially for you to go in and look at other sellers, but 20% of people are doing it. 80% of people are not. So really, really critical in any case to, you know, get onto as many different channels as possible. And I think the opportunity here is gargantuan, right? I mean, outside of Amazon, there's tons of other marketplaces. Fred has already highlighted a bunch of them, um, other marketplace channels globally that are coming, coming up. Some of them are very new. Some of them are older kind of marketplace channels that are pivoting and readjusting to try to capture more market share. Um, but there are a lot of kind of, I would say, mid-tier marketplaces and smaller marketplaces that are really getting creative and innovating and finding ways to win market share and, and create features that are really interesting to users and to customers. Um, I think, you know, one of the ones or a couple of the ones that I'll mention right now, just to kind of reiterate what Fred was speaking about, um, I think Facebook's commerce options in particular have been really popular with many of our clients. Um, they're doing a lot of really interesting things and I think are a really good example of ways to just kind of think outside the box and figure out you know, what can they do to attract other buyers? Um, Instagram checkout, I think in particular is really interesting. Um, I know that's not available everywhere globally yet, but I would certainly keep an eye on it um, when it's released, uh, get in, get in early. Um, there's a lot of influencer features there that are really interesting. Uh, definitely something to consider. Um, and then ads with checkout is something that I think is about to start in beta in the US. So again, keep an eye on that if you're outside of the US, well, anywhere you are in any case, um, but ads with beta, very similar in any case, uh, essentially, as I understand it today, essentially display ads with a checkout feature, uh, also very interesting. Um, and then Target, you know, Target Plus is, uh, again, another one that I think has a lot of really unique features. Exclusivity is a really big one. So essentially, if you are the first seller to sell a particular SKU on Target Plus, that's it. No competition there. Of course, you need approval, so try to get it. Um, but a lot of different marketplaces that are working on, again, really interesting things. Um, so just getting into a couple of best practices, specifically around Amazon, it's not always as simple as just listing your products and, and kind of letting people buy it, right? I think Amazon in particular has a pretty specific set of requirements and approvals for the types of products that they accept. Their objective, of course, is to create the best user experience possible for us, everybody that they're trying to sell to, everybody that's buying on the platform. And so, you know, there's... Um, Requirements, approvals, a couple categories here, automotive, jewelry, grocery, et cetera. I mean, these are all, all product categories that require, I think, a little bit more work than, again, just listing. Um, there's kind of a question between fulfilled by merchant, uh, that's FBM, that's when you're listing on Amazon and you actually fulfill and ship the orders out, or fulfilled by Amazon, which is something that I think everybody has experienced as well. Um, for FBA fulfilled by Amazon, um, you know, we do catalog and there's some different reporting, uh, features that happen there as well. But one of the early kind of decisions that need to be made there and there are pros and cons, right? I think I'll, I'll speak to you very briefly, um, at the beginning of COVID, which I'm sure you all have heard of, um, a lot of merchants were in a pretty bad place because as they were fulfilled by Amazon and Amazon kind of made a switch to, uh, essentially delay shipments for anything that was considered non-essential, a lot of merchants were in a really bad spot, right? They just could not get their products out there. And so I think big movements globally like that um, have driven a lot of our clients and a lot of brands out there to just seek alternate marketplaces and figure out, you know, where else can I go to get my products out there? Um, and then the parent-child relationship one, that's a really interesting one. Um, oftentimes just a general feed optimization challenge is, um, where a lot of clients, a lot of brands are sending feeds of just parent level SKUs, Amazon requires basically everything to be listed out as child. And so um, some people are able to do that within their e-commerce system. Other folks will work with um, 
providers like us, feed management partners that can help them kind of expand out their catalog and make sure that they have everything and all the information that they need in order to list on Amazon and, and some of these other marketplaces. Um, like every other channel and, you know, as critical certainly as any other platform is optimization of the actual data. Um, sending out what's raw, so to speak, in your e-commerce system just isn't really going to cut it when we're, you know, the main way that people are finding is via the search and relevancy is so key. Um, so, you know, working with a feed provider like Feedonomics or anybody else that's out there that does something similar, um, in any case, making sure that the product data is as, as optimized as possible is really, really important. So you know, bringing in as many attributes into titles, uh, making sure that descriptions, categorization is all very clean, products are really easy to find, and then looks in, you know, look um, is formatted in a way that looks really nice and appears really nice to customers, again, is how you can really make sure that your products are being surfaced, that they're being seen, and ultimately being purchased by the people that you want them to. Um, testing is really important. And um, I think one of the main things that we really focus on for clients, um, I think some of the you know most successful sellers and, and really just brands in general are taking a really data-driven approach these days. Um, going out there to identify you know what kind of analytics are available, what kind of data that they have access to already or that they can find, whether it's, you know, performance, margin data, competitor data, and bringing that in to make really um, uh, really kind of creative uh, rules to, you know, figure out how they're pricing and figure out, you know, whether certain orientation of titles or attributes within their listings perform better than others. I think it's something that's really critical to do kind of on an ongoing basis. Um, and then I guess just a tip here on the brand registry side, if you're a, a brand that's selling on Amazon, Something that's uh, definitely an advantage for you is to get in on the brand registry. Uh, it's very similar to Google Manufacturer Center, if you all are familiar with that. But as a brand owner, it essentially allows you to own the ASINs. Um, ASINs, of course, being kind of Amazon's unique identifier, very similar to a G10, if you're familiar with that. Um, and I'll get to in a couple minutes why the ASIN and owning it is so important. But uh, a few kind of thoughts on optimization there. Um, I think I saw earlier in the chat there were a couple questions around the buy box. Obviously, super critical with 80% of these purchases on these platforms actually going to whoever owns the buy box. Now, we can't guarantee, and, and I don't think there's any provider out there that can, uh, that you'll absolutely win the buy box, but there are a few kind of best practices that you can employ to make it a lot more likely. I think, generally speaking, um, you know, kind of going back, Amazon and all of these different platforms are looking to provide the best experience possible to their consumers. So us, the buyers, right? And so I think generally playing by Amazon's rules um, as much as possible will, will certainly help, right? Um, price obviously is a factor in inventory. So um, one of the really critical things that we're doing for clients on the marketplace side is just setting inventory rules, right? And so um, an example scenario, uh, would be, you know, you're selling on your website, you're selling on Amazon and potentially a few other marketplaces. How can you effectively manage your inventory across all of them and make sure that you're not overselling, uh, which is generally a big no-no, right? Uh, sellers that oversell immediately red flagged definitely impacts your chances of being in the buy box. Um, and so there are ways that you can set really unique rules when you're working with an integrator or through a kind of unifying platform going to marketplaces to set rules to say, take total inventory, you know, reserve a certain number, say reserve 10 for the website, and then take um, you know, remaining inventory and divide evenly between the different marketplaces that you're selling on, for example. And then kind of a double safety net around that, potentially another rule that says, you know, if inventory falls below a certain threshold, essentially set to out of stock, just to make it extra safe and build in a little bit of that buffer. Dynamic inventory rules, super, super critical. Um, and beyond that, I think just freshness of information, right? I mean, a, a lot of people starting out on Amazon and eBay and a lot of these marketplaces will just kind of go in like, you know, URI or any individual could enlist their products, fulfill orders manually through the system, put in tracking information. But I think as you're expanding to different marketplaces, 
the scalability of that kind of approach uh, gets a lot more difficult. And so uh, being able to work on a unified platform that can manage order flows, catalog listing and delisting, as well as all of these inventory rules and other safety nets is really critical. And um, through like a direct order integration, you're able to just bring data that's inventory information, sales information, returns, all of the all of that uh, going between your systems and the marketplaces as quickly as possible. Also very critical just to make sure that the customers are seeing the most updated uh, data. Um, and I guess finally on the error resolution piece, um, this is really why ASINs are so important. And so anybody that's already selling on Amazon and anybody that's planning to should definitely have this on their radar. Um, Amazon in particular, as I mentioned, very, very particular about the way that their product data appears to us, the consumers, right? And so essentially what happens is that the first seller that sells a product on Amazon essentially creates the ASIN. Um, and the ASIN, of course, contains all of the different product attributes included in that SKU when it's listed. So, you know, title, color, size, material, everything that's included there essentially is fixed within that ASIN. And so any subsequent seller of that exact same product essentially has to match. And that's the way that Amazon guarantees that the products that you're listing uh, are appearing and are exactly the right product for the customers to actually buy. Now, the headache here is that if your product data does not exactly match, it's disapproved and they don't make it super easy to figure out you know which products are disapproved and why and so error resolution again is really critical and you can kind of see a few examples here um, for this dress for example uh, your value for size in the feed is XL right and Amazon's ASIN value is extra large sensibly the same thing I think we can all tell that that's pretty much the same that's enough to get you disapproved so I think having a system that has a really robust error resolution feature or functionality is going to be really important. Um, and, you know, something that I mentioned earlier, the brand registry as well is um, also kind of critical and is a massive advantage because if you're the brand owner, you really should be the ones that are defining what the default attributes are. Everyone else can adhere to your standards, not the other way around. Um, so just a few thoughts really on Amazon and uh, some of the best practices there. Um, I think going into just marketplaces in general, uh, I guess handing it back to you, Fred, um, just best practices overall. Thank you, Jason. That was, that was great. You come from, from where Jason was. Um, what we're going to look up now is effectively the layered approach in order to, to tackle your, your feed management best practices um, when, when connecting up to, to marketplaces. Um, First of all, yeah, thank you to everyone who submitted uh, challenges uh, and questions so far. Please uh, keep keep them coming in, um, and we're, you've still got time, uh, and you'll be able to submit right till the end, and, and we'll be sure to answer any questions between myself and Jason at the end. So, in terms of layering on uh, feed management for for Amazon, what you want to do really is is look at it like this. First of all, it is if you're looking down the bottom of the screen is to lay the foundations ensure data is accurate testing is regular uh, at this point we encourage people to leverage more of their own data and i'll dig into that in a bit more detail in a second um, then also uh, sharing with other with other channels as well and then finally how we then uh, utilize external data to effectively supercharge uh, your feeds and really stand out from from the crowd on the marketplace so in terms of laying the foundations, it's all about ensuring your data is accurate and up to date, which I'm sure Jason had just mentioned before as well. So there's kind of four areas that we like to look at here. Uh, consistency. Um, so this is really just ensuring that the data is live and fully up to date at all times. And this is price, delivery, availability and promotions. And I mean, Jason spoke through there as well, the potential as well to put in feed rules where maybe stock drops below 100 you just pull the pull the items off site the consistency is so vitally important on marketplaces i mean for any advertising you're doing online it's important uh, on marketplaces you you heavily risk ending ending up trying to fulfill an order that you don't have in stock so it's so vital that this consistency is there um once you're happy with the consistency as well product selection is is so important and there's two two areas to this really um many marketplaces have huge 
product restrictions. Uh, eBay it is not necessarily one of them. You pretty much have free reign. However, other marketplaces can be quite stringent. Uh, the selection goes beyond this though. Um, the other things that you need to look at when you're doing your selection is obviously your product margins. Um, you wanna be looking at your ratings uh, on site. Um, and that way you can make sure that you're pushing the better products onto, onto the marketplace in which you want to use. Um, one other thing as well that I'm going to speak through in a bit more detail is actually pulling that performance data back into, into your product data um, just to make sure that you are pushing uh, the products that are driving the most sales and actually not, not pushing the other ones or potentially putting them on, onto sale. Finally, and uh, well, not finally, one more to go through is quality. Uh, and Jason touched on this as well, it's made, playing by Amazon's rules, as he put it, um, making sure you have a full set of attributes and that it's continuously optimized towards marketplace specific characteristics. So you really want to just make sure that you're not just filling in um, the required fields, but you're also filling in all the optional fields as well. Uh, and then the final bit here is constant monitoring. So this, this goes for regular auditing of, of your feeds and how products are performing but also uh, regularly uh, doing error resolution as well, making sure that you're fixing any issues that do flag up in the feed. So once you've done this, um, there's two really, two really cool bits here, really in terms of how you leverage your own data uh, and then how, how you actually share this with other channels. So if we're looking at a standard uh, data, data flow here, you've got raw data going in, uh, it gets mapped, it gets standardized uh, in a, in a standard form in, in your feed management platform, you then transport, transform this and export it out the other end to your paid media channels, to your affiliates and all other exports. Now, what people do at this point is they tend to leave it. Um, what you should be doing is actually plugging that performance data from all the channels back into the feed um, in order to, to power it further. Uh, you also should be pulling in stocks and returns data. Obviously, stock is absolute must for marketplaces, but it's worth looking at including returns data as well in that if, if you can. Um, and then finally, also including your margin data. This could be great in terms of decision making uh, on marketplaces and what products to push where. And I'll dig into that in a bit more detail. So first of all, performance data. Um, recommend if you use Google Analytics, it's effectively merging uh, product skew level Google Analytics data back into your feed um, and then actually pushing that that data back out to the platforms that you need. So this can work across any number of different platforms, but the output is effectively that you can push the better performing products and pull back on the least performing products. Benefit, push top performing products and push, uh, and push least performing products as sale or, or to offload the stock. Um, you can do a similar thing with Amazon's data itself, product level performance data, schedule this reporting back, integrate back in with your feed management platform, and then you can make decisions based on how they're performing on your Amazon advertising uh, and how they're generally selling on, on and through Amazon. And you can optimize this and make decisions based on performance. Stock, as I said, stock, absolutely vital as a must, but then if you can also include returns and cancellations, um, you can actually in integrate uh, a lot more uh, valuable data into your system. If an item's selling, uh, but then it's getting returned 50, 60, 70% of the time, then obviously your actual ROI that you're measuring, uh, measuring and the, the revenue that you're measuring isn't what it was cut out to be. So sending uh, this off uh, to different channels and making sure that you're optimizing to this figure enables you to optimize to a true revenue figure and also crucially understand your product quality and demand. Finally, uh, product margin, uh, recommend people do this across all advertising platforms, but in specifically when looking at marketplaces, um, you combine your product margin uh, with the marketplace business model. So if it's a commission rate, um, then using this information, you can actually optimize to your margin of ad spend, but you can also make sure that you're only listing products on each, each marketplace that is actually offering, offering you profitability. And that way it's fully automated in the system. And when, when a product um, actually hits a certain level of profitability, you can automatically push it into different marketplaces. Um, so ensure profitability on all listed products on site. This is really the key step in, in the current climate, I would say, is make sure that you integrate uh, your margin data and ensuring profitability at all times. 
So what a lot of people do at this point uh, is that they only run this strategy for one one channel. Uh, and what this means is that a lot of different teams are doing a lot of different things. You've got a team in Amazon doing one thing and a team in your Google Ads doing another thing and display doing another thing. And ultimately what you're doing is you're repeating a lot of tasks. You're not centralizing your workload and you're not not uh, and you're costing yourself a huge, huge amount of money. So what we'd always recommend is that all of all of the optimization uh, you can possibly do is done in the feeds and then you only make the tweaks right at the end. So you use your feed management platform as your major source of truth and then you push out uh, any of the specific channel aspects right at the last moment. And finally, uh, what one of the cooler bits to look at is, is using external data. So if, if you're sitting in a position where you you think your data is accurate, is up to date, um, you're leveraging as much as for your own data, your performance data, your margin data, all that stuff that makes you unique, uh, it's at this point that you can actually go away and start thinking about what other data, third-party data and APIs and tools can I use to really take this to the next level. So a lot, a lot of things we've done in the past is using using fantasy football APIs, for instance, to to sell uh, football T-shirts of players who are performing quite well. Um, and we've done a number of things with weather. So obviously pushing certain products depending on the weather at a given time. This can all be automated within your feed. So if it starts raining, you can start pushing pushing umbrellas on Amazon. Or if it starts, if it's sunny in the US, then you might want to start pushing flip flops um, in in onto target plus so those are kind of decisions that can all be automated and centralized um, within your feed management platform one of the cool things you can do is actually ex assessing your your product positioning uh, so you monitor the landscape across google and amazon um, and you can start doing some really cool things like showing the overlap rate you have with with other competitors so whether these competitors be on amazon or google you can we can tell you hey you are about 20% of your product overlap with this brand and about 30% of your products overlap with this brand and where those overlaps are. And this will enable you to make better decisions on what products to push on, on what marketplace. Uh, we can reveal specific products or categories where pricing strategies are not aligned uh, with competitors. So either you're, you're much cheaper than a competitor or you're much more expensive than a competitor. And as a result of this, you can make you can make buying decisions, obviously, uh, but you can also make decisions uh, to do with your marketing. So you can push and pull um, products based on how price competitive you are at that moment. Uh, you model the impact of, of pricing on, on your performance, and that will help you make better decisions in the future. So it's all about an iterative approach whereby you're taking this data, you're working out the performance, and then you're feeding it back in to, to power your campaigns further. Uh, and finally, uh, the key to all of this really in terms of feed management and also in terms of uh, working with marketplaces is, is automation. The whole thing end to end needs to be automated. So if someone's not going online and saying, oh, this product is it shouldn't be showing because it's not profitable or X, Y, or Z. The reason, uh, the reason that we, we need to do this is because it wastes time. So if this, these decisions can be made formulaically, in inside the feed management platform you won't have to be going on and, and checking checking the products on site as you might do if it was done in a more manual fashion so really key uh, in terms of in pushing certain products on certain sites is is all to do with knowing your product sweet spots um so in terms of what i've just run over is i think the key for anyone who's just starting out on on a marketplace is to lay the foundations make sure your data is consistent, accurate, you're playing by Amazon's rules. And after this, start leveraging your own data much further. And then finally, um, once you've done all of this, uh, I very highly recommend to start looking elsewhere and start looking at some external data that you can use and place into your data feed to supercharge uh, anything that you run through marketplaces. So I believe Jason's going to take you through case study. There he is. All right. Thanks, Fred. Um, yeah, just jumping back in to talk through, uh, you know, just a, a really good example of kind of all of the things that we're talking about here. Um, there's a client that we work with, it's Ambush Skateboarding Company, um, based here in the U.S., and they had a really kind of difficult challenge. I think right before holiday, I think it was Memorial Day last year, uh, they basically pushed some bad code and got 
basically completely disapproved from Amazon, which was disastrous, right? It was a big holiday weekend, planning the big sales for them. Um, and so they engaged with us. And really the first thing that we did was make sure to get all of the data clean. And so Feedonomics, one of the things that we offer, a couple of the things that we offer are products, catalog, listing, and delisting, of course, cleaning up and optimizing all of the actual product data, but also the order integration piece, which I mentioned before. Essentially, uh, we become this hub and platform for customers to send all of their product data and receive orders from really any number of marketplace channels, um, really that omni-channel approach. And so those were the two things that they really needed to solve, right? This immediate problem of, I need to get my disapprovals lifted so I can start selling on Amazon again, but also want to figure out what other marketplace channels we can go to in order to get more product out there in this time. And so long story short, we solved the data problem, set up the order integration to get Amazon back up again, uh, which you know not only actually allowed them to sell, but through the optimization actually helped increase their sales um, kind of over that period by about 260%. But also we're able to integrate them with a few other marketplace channels that they were interested in that were coming up at that time. Um, eBay, of course, was one that was is established. Um, they started listing on eBay and with all of the different uh, optimization rules that we had put in place for them, managed to actually increase revenue on that channel, which I believe they had been doing manually before that by about 290%. And then they were able to test uh, uh, Google Shopping Actions, which is you know one that Fred mentioned as well, um, and essentially doubled their revenue on that channel as well. So you know, really great example, really critical one. Um, I think you know that omni-channel approach is a really important kind of strategy to take at this point, getting the products out and getting you know, integrated with as many of these marketplaces as possible and really testing and being intentional and figuring out, you know, which are effective, which customers are responding to and how the data can be optimized to really capture as much of their attention as possible. Something definitely to focus on uh, moving forward. I mean, selling on websites, of course, certainly works, but again, it's an omni-channel world, get the customers where they are, right? Um, so, you know, Again, thank you all for taking the time. Uh, we really appreciate you know you making time out of your busy schedule. Uh, just a last minute reminder, you know, following up on this uh, webinar to sign up for the actual workshop that we'll be doing. Uh, Fred and our marketplace director at Feedonomics, Dimitri, will be doing you know a much longer session to kind of deep dive on a lot of the topics that we talked about here today. Um, and, and really just help you work out a good strategy and, and best practice approaches uh, to getting your brand and, and your products out into different marketplaces. Um, so the information is here. Definitely don't forget to sign up. And um, again, any questions? I think we're going to dive right into that. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'm just trying to get my video back up. Gotta love when tech works. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Jason, and thank you, Fred, so much for all of that. We've had some really interesting questions come in. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, as Jason mentioned, we are hosting a, a workshop. Um, it's free to attend, limited spaces, so please register your interest. I've put the link in the chat function if you are interested. Um, other than that, I'm gonna jump straight into the questions. So Corey has asked, we have an established brand on Amazon FBA, um, but we have gotten in, but we have not gotten into Walmart and Target. Any recommendations on getting in? What is required to be invited? Hmm. Um, I, I could speak to that one. Um, it, it it depends, I guess. <laughs> I don't know that either channel necessarily has. Um, hard and fast rules on who they're kind of accepting and who they're not. Um, oftentimes it just takes a little bit of a push. And so potentially something that we can address offline, um, if anybody's been struggling to get in, no guarantees, um, providing that there aren't kind of specific product restrictions. Obviously there are certain categories of products that, uh, you know, certain channels don't allow. Um, but, you know, Incubata, uh, Feedonomics, we have relationships with, you know, a lot of these different channels. And so, um, I think just giving them a nudge on a certain side potentially uh, could help with that. So that's something that we can look into and, and kind of address. Um, sometimes that's all it takes. 
Amazing. Um, another question from Neil. Any good way to be competitive on marketplaces with MAP priced items where everyone is listing the same price? Coupons, incentives, etc. Huh. I think uh, so some of the some of the strategies, obviously, that we that we've spoken through uh, earlier today. So uh, when I was going through the feed strategies, um, it, they're going to help. Um, so if you can actually work out if you are price competitive on those products and only pushing them at that point, uh, if they are the exact same price, uh, then yeah, uh, things like coupons incentives can can support that. Um, also, I think it's worth looking at at your margins on those products as well, just to see if you can. Uh, drop the product price in order to, to become the cheapest in the market. Yeah, what I would add to that as well is, you know, if you if price is not something that you can compete on necessarily, I think looking at some of the other attributes that Fred mentioned, uh, specifically around optimization, probably is where you want to go, right? So um, similar kind of philosophy as is on the advertising side, Relevancy does play a role in how results are shown and, and, and who's winning the buy box. Um, so making sure that the product data is optimized, as much of the attributes as are available are included, they're clean, they're appearing the right way. Um, I think price being equal, the seller with the better optimized data typically um, is going to win. Thank you. Um, I have seen that some of you are having trouble filling out the form. Um, we, our tech team is working to get the form up and working, um, should be ready by the end of the day. If not, those of you who have um, let me know, I will take your names down. Also, we will be sending you a follow-up email, just reply to that and we will be able to um, make sure you're on the list to attend. Um, and I do have more questions. Um, so from Victoria, which platforms allow pre-owned goods like vintage brand name and designer runaway clothing, shoes, handbags, accessory items? Um, these products are one of a kind, but very profitable. Interesting. Um, well, eBay, of course, is one. Uh, that's one that's very established. Um, the thing, Etsy, of course, is another one, uh, one of my favorites, certainly for those kinds of unique products. Um, I think generally speaking, the Amazons and the Walmarts and the Targets of the world probably aren't going to be necessarily a good fit. Um, if you're in the US, potentially Instagram checkout would be a, a really interesting one, uh, just because a lot of those kinds of products, I think oftentimes are tied to those kinds of followings. Um, I think the challenge with unique uh, one-of-a-kind items is that it's just a scale thing, right? So, you know, whether you're optimizing a product with just one in inventory or uh, a thousand, um, the amount of work is really the same. But it is definitely something that can be done. I think those are probably the channels that I would consider. Um, and we've got two minutes, so I think we've got time for two questions left. Um, Charlotte has asked, how can you avoid overselling on marketplaces? Uh, overselling, um, yeah, I mean, this is something that we talked about a few times. Fred definitely mentioned it as well. It is the thing that is going to be the biggest headache for you and, and really cause the, the most red flags on all of these marketplaces. I think really just having a good understanding and a good strategy for inventory management and low level inventory rules in particular is going to be critical. Um, this is the example where you're dividing inventory between different channels dynamically based on you know your feeds. Um, I think you're most at risk of overselling when you are manually managing orders within maybe a few different marketplace channels, right? If you're logging into Amazon and marking something as shipped and then logging into eBay and marking something as shipped, it's very easy between different channels and updating manually uh, inventory numbers to make a mistake and, and oversell. So I think having a good integration partner and a good technology there is really important. All right, and our last question um, from Corey again. After Amazon and Google, what are the next up and coming markets? Does it depend on the type of product? Any expectations of Facebook and Instagram versus Walmart versus Target? Um, where is the time and effort best spent? Cool. Um, I mean, I, I know you said after after Amazon and Google, but uh, Google's uh, marketplace is, is relatively new. 
Um, so I would say that that is something that is definitely also going to be be up and coming in the uh, in the coming years, especially because it's only currently present in the US. After that, I would say that there's some fairly big um, marketplaces that are growing uh, out of out of Europe at the moment as well. So you've got Onbuy, you've got Frugo as well that are, are growing yeah. quite rapidly. Um, these would be very, very good marketplaces to get involved in. Now, um, you get added benefits with these ones, uh, especially on the on-buy side, very quick and easy to, to integrate with. Um, and also the commission rates um, are more favorable to, to something like you would get on Amazon. So definitely would be looking at some of the smaller ones like on-buy and, and Frugo as well around Europe. I yeah, and I, I think adding to that, um, Corey, I actually see uh, an earlier question of yours around Facebook and Instagram specifically. But I think among our clients, those are the channels that have been growing the most. Um, I think over the last year or so, Instagram checkout specifically, but all of Facebook's commerce options have really just exploded in popularity. Um, definitely depends on the category of product. So um, apparel, I think apparel, jewelry, those kinds of luxury items definitely do better on Instagram checkout than say like kitchen appliances, right? Um, eBay, of course, is going to be much better for say like refurbished goods. Um, there's kind of best practices for every different type of product. Um, but the answer is yes. I mean, to your question as well, all of these platforms are heavily, heavily investing in trying to take market share away from Amazon. Google, of course, being a good example, as Fred mentioned on the shopping action site, everybody sees that 55% and, and that 92% number that we talked about earlier. And they want a piece of it, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of experimentation happening. There's a lot of investment happening. And I think that we'll see a lot more players in this space. Um, I mean, even just the ones that we've talked about today, Facebook, uh, Instagram checkout, Target Plus, Walmart, these are all channels, even Google Shopping Actions that have launched just in the last year or so. Um, definitely something to keep an eye on. All right. Thank you both so much. Um, Fred, I'm going to leave you with the last question, which is what do viewers do if they want to learn more or get in touch and get started? Yeah, so I mean, Lisa's already touched on this, but what what's going to happen after after this is uh, we will send an email out, and it will have all of the material that we've gone through today, as well as as well as a recording. Uh, and then after this, we'll also send uh, out uh, details about the training course, which has been mentioned. Um, and in there, you will be able to register. Uh, and then if you wanted to attend, that would be happening in in September, and it should be a really really good session. Um, I'll be doing it uh, with Dimitri uh, from from Feednomics. Very very smart guy. knows his knows his stuff. So definitely worth coming along for that. Um, and my tech team has confirmed that the link should be working now. Um, but if you have said that you are interested, we have taken your name down, and we will make sure that you are on that list. Um, thank you so much um, to both you, Fred and Jason, for being a part of today and taking 50 minutes out of your day to teach us all about marketplaces. Um, look forward to those emails from us. And thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.